the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics, founded in 2016 by Dawn Lundy Martin and Terrence Hayes, is a creative think tank for African American and African diasporic poetries and poetics. Our mission is to highlight, promote, and share the work of Black poets and to pollinate cross-disciplinary conversation and collaboration. Our programming aims to present exciting live poetry and conversation, contextualize the meaning of that work, and archive it for future generations. The work of the Center is vital at this particular time, when so many Black poets are at the forefront of contemporary American poetry. African diasporic poets are pushing the envelope of poetics and expressions of Blackness through art. Though some attention has been paid to the fact of Black poetry, there has been little discussion of what the diverse Black poetries of this particular moment mean and do. In a climate of renewed attention on racial disparities and systematic violence against African Americans and other people of color, the center is focused on a poetics of engagement. In relation to this historic moment and with an eye toward moments to come, since our inception, we have hosted world-renowned poets, visual artists, architects, filmmakers, and scholars, including Claudia Rankine, Fred Moten, Thaddeus Mosley, Carrie Mae Weems, Ross Gay, Carl Phillips, John Keane, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Lorna Simpson, Arthur Jaffa, and Christina Sharp. These are just a handful of the esteemed guests who have visited CAP in various capacities over the past three years. There are four MacArthur Genius Award winners among them. Our community partners are crucial to our mission. Poets and writers are featured on campus, but they also visit our community partners in their constituencies, often leading hands-on workshops in intimate settings in historically Black neighborhoods, such as the Hill District and Homewood. Through this engagement, we not only bridge the gap between the university and the community, but we elevate and expand the work that poetry can do. Good evening. I'm Dawn Lundy Martin. I am the director of the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics. We call it CAP, C A A P P. And I welcome you to this really special evening with Rosa Alcala and Cecilia Vicuña, which we've titled Liquid Stars Translation, Digression, Transformation. Liquid Stars is a phrase stolen from Cecilia Vicuña, and I selected it because I was thinking about this particular moment in history and its feeling of impossibility and the feeling of stuckness and how we might liberate ourselves inside of it. What do we do with impossible desire in this time rife with entrapments of all kinds? The entrapment of the home, the entrapment of interior spaces, the entrapment of not having interior spaces to access, the entrapment of our vulnerable bodies, the way that institutions and social structures circulate to bring the brunt of racism and misogyny onto our already vulnerable bodies. How do we say no, as Vicuña did in 1967 in the No Manifesto of the No Tribe? How do we say yes to possibility as Alcala does in her luminous translations of Acuna's poetry and performances. Is the liquid star where the imagination enters? Our work at CAP until now has been focused on black poetry and poetics, African diasporic poetry and poetics, but Angie Cruz and I and our reflection on what we need to tend to now as poets, artists, and creatives glean that the necessary conversations are across the taxonomies of race. As much as we recognize the specific predicaments for Black people and the conditions that produce those predicaments, we recognize as well that those same conditions stretch the notions of Blackness. And this is theoretical and actual, right? It's, they stretch the notions of Blackness and who gets dehumanized and disparaged and inside of what rationales of humanness. As Muhammad Ali said in response to resisting the Vietnam draft in 1968, quote, I can't 
I just can't see it, man. I can't go over to Vietnam and shoot them people and come back here and I ain't free. Now they want me to go to Vietnam and shoot some black folks that never lynched me, never called me the N word, never put no dog on me, never assassinated my leaders. Now he said the actual word, right? Not the N word, but that's not my point. My point is that solidarity can only happen in action. And to call the Vietnamese people black is not to take away the specificity of anyone's identity. Instead is to say, sister, brother, sibling, I see you, I feel you, contigo. At CAP, we say now to our Asian American and Pacific Islander siblings, we're with you, contigo, we see you. Anti AAPI violence, anti indigenous violence, anti black violence, and violence against all people of color, those who identify as women, femme, non binary, and trans. These are exactly the reasons that we at CAP have shifted our work and our programming these months to be in conversation across identities and experiences in this country and the world. We could feel the violent tenor of this nation throbbing against us, and we knew it would be important to have these conversations in our public forums. And we say no to this violence. And we say yes to the power of performance, art making, poetry, resistance, activism, and all creativity as we name it as soul saving. We name it as transformative in its digressiveness. And we wanna look at the liquid stars and think of them as undercurrents against the so-called rational and its strategies for organization and separation. I believe that there's so much possibility for liberation here within and outside and up against the systems and the institutions that dictate those taxonomies of race and try to separate us, right? Um, so that said, I turn now to thank an actors, right? We will do the work with that. I wanna thank the Spirit Warrior Series for co-sponsoring this event with us and the Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences and the Dietrich Foundation for providing the financial and other resources necessary for us to do our work. Welcome again. Now I turn it over to my colleague, the novelist, Angie Cruz, who will introduce the evening. Hi, thank you so much for that, Don, um, and wonderful introduction. Um, we are thrilled um, to have Rosa Alcala and Cecilia Vicuña join us today. I've had the privilege to be in conversation with Rosa for a number of years about her poetry, about translation, and being the daughters of working class immigrant parents. The first time I saw Cecilia perform, I was in grad school. It was the late 1990s at Housing Works New York City where she unspooled yarn and had, as all of us audience members held, um, hold on to different pieces, extending the yarn all around the room until the yarn completely unraveled. As audience members, we were bound together. You could hear a pin drop riveted as she performed her work. Um, Rosa and Cecilia have been in conversation for almost 25 years. When Rosa was still a grad student and toying with the idea of translation, she wrote to Cecilia about how much she loved her work and Cecilia invited her to visit. That's like back in the day, she actually wrote a letter and Cecilia invited her over. <laughs> um, since Rosa has translated and transcribed the poetry and multilingual performances of Cecilia's book, Spit Temple, and also edited and translated Cecilia Vicuña's new and selected poems retranslating earlier translations. Cecilia's work often begins life as a poem and unfolds in various forms, a site-specific installation, performance, ritual, song, a film. Over the past 50 years, Vicuña has produced an extraordinary multidisciplinary archive of work, publishing over 20 books. She has exhibited in many museums, including ICA in London, the Whitney, and the MoMA in New York. Most recently, the Wit the Wit Center for Contemporary Art in Rotterdam held Vicuña's first major retrospective, and Vicuña was awarded both the 2019 Herb Alpert Prize and Spain's most prestigious award, the 2019 
Premio Velázquez de Arte Plásticas. In addition to being a translator, Rosa Alcala is the author of three books of poetry, Undocumentaries, The Lust of Unsentimental Waters, and My Other Tongue. That was published most, re that book was most published, um, recently published in 2017. Her poems have appeared in numerous anthologies, including Best American Poetry 2019. She's the recipient of National Endowment for the Arts Translation Fellowship and a finalist for the Penn Translation Award. She's also a professor in, in the bilingual MFA in creative writing at UT El Paso. When asked about translation, Cecilia said, meeting the translators has been one of the most beautiful things that has ever happened to me. Because at the same time that I arrived in the US, because I was expelled from the universe I was born into by the military coup in Chile. She, ex she says expelled, not exiled, because when exiled, you are really nothing, like the fleas. But soon after arrival to the US, when she landed as an unwanted being in the US, when she encountered the translators, the translators are the ones who wanted to open up what nobody wanted to see. And about Rosa Alcala, she said, when Rosa goes into the poem, she sees in the poem what not even I saw. She sees what the poem itself saw. That's the value of translation. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm really excited for this event. We will start our presentation today with the video Empire that is premiering today um, that Cecilia created especially for the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics. Um, it has never ever been seen before. We feel really privileged um, to be here watching it.
Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> you ready, Cecilia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. We're going to read something and it's called El alma se da en la sombra. The soul emerges in shadow. And the title is from um, Jose Lizama Lima. Daniel Brzezinski quotes you as saying that translation is the darkness the translator enters to see what the poet couldn't see, to see what the poem itself saw. And I imagine this as meaning that the translator doesn't enter the darkness to probe with a harsh beam of light, but to sit with what curls into itself or burrows, the thing that might take shape as the eyes adjust or may never. Before making a move, she learns to respect, to borrow from Edouard Glissant, the poem's opacity, what cannot be grasped, meaning possessed or understood. Yes, I imagine <clears throat> the translator as entering into an impossible situation something beyond difficult calls us in, beckons with its dark light, as you have heard me say so many times. It is the negative space, what's not there, what really shapes the rest. In the Andes, this is an aesthetic and philosophical concern 
with political consequences, which I think has infected many of us, mestizo artists and poets, with its magnetic appeal. José Lezama Lima escribió, El alma se da en la sombra. The soul emerges in shadow. As you see, I am utterly unable to translate his expression. The soul emerges in shadow is probably closest to the original meaning, but I find as someone who feels an outsider to both Spanish and English that I see and hear too much in even the everyday phrase. I think this is why I became a poet, that witnessing of language from the outside so I am fixated on the phrase se da because of its relationship to the verb dar, to give or offer, and to the other meaning of darse, to hurt oneself or give up. I want to say, in shadow, the soul offers itself to expose the erotic exchange I sense and with it an embodied understanding of the soul. But I also want to convey the undercurrent of risk and how to do it all. This is how I get into the translation weeds, how I end up grieving the death of so many possibilities. When I first started translating you, I imagined a book that would capture the ways a poem is opened and multiplies in translation. I wanted the book to contain not final versions, but all of them, and to retain the marks inflicted on both poem and translation as we work together. Remember how I had arrived at your door after work from one of my many temp assignments on Wall Street, desperate for illumination. I thought the problem was my Spanish, its poverty and stupid upbringing. So I'd fax my translations to you throughout the day instead of filling out expense reports. But you rarely met my questions with direct answers. A word or line became a conversation that meandered through decades, that led to your filing cabinets where you'd pull out poems typed long ago on transparent paper. We were unproductive, we wasted time, we walked by the river. When we returned in the evening up the buildings back stairs, you'd lead us through the dark loft at Tientas without turning the lights on. You weren't scared, you told me. You could feel your way through. Everything was just where we left it. Yes, I still do that. I prefer the dark to artificial light. The dark frees us to be who we're not supposed to be in this culture that suppresses not only the living wilderness of all creatures, but our own creatureness, our own wildness. In the dark, I feel better. As you know, I have writing pads around the house, especially around the bed and other dark corners where I meditate or just lie down on the floor in oblivion to everything. That's the time when images feel they can come, suggesting their presence as a faint ruidito or a fragrance we cannot exactly locate. I remember how difficult it was for you to find a way to translate those first works we were dealing with. But somehow I knew that what vibrated in you as a child with the flamenco cante you heard at home over and over again, had placed a seed in you that would lead you to a song where you already belonged because you heard it even before you were being born. I trusted that you would find the guidance of the pain transformed in the notes that can't be heard. And you did. 
you became the poet translator the poems wanted? Or was it the other way around? Meaning your thirst found the poems? It works both ways and we will never know how. I come from textile factory workers who were paid by the hour, who spun thread or dyed fabric to meet production quotas, who clocked in and out. All those factories have gone dark or have been turned into artist housing. But I hold tight the thread that snapped off a bobbin when the machine was shut off mid-production and when I tie it to your poems to keep the machine going, you begin to sing, and then there are many more threads loose and catching the light. Mm -hmm. It was so moving to me that you never forgot the factory life your parents endured, the contamination that affected them, and you, and your brothers. The pain met with that tesson, that inner beauty that never lets go. I think the threads of humiliation, joy and laughter we inherit from our parents are forever there, if we can open up to feel them. I remember when I suddenly understood the origin of my own translation of threads into poetry. In an image of my mother knitting while I crawl on all fours as babies do, under the threads catching light, as you say. What Am I translating in my weavings? The umbilical cord metamorphosized into thread? The invisible connection between mother and daughter? I went into my archives looking for your response to the first letter I wrote you in 1995 and found the outline to Spit Temple, facts to your loft in 2001 from Brooklyn, a couple of weeks before 9-11 at 6.37 a.m., to which you later added notes. One says, I am not fitting in another fields of tinku, tinku meaning encounter in Quechua. I also found a poem you must have faxed around the same time, clean of marks, never translated. It's called Los Desaparecidos, The Disappeared. Immediately, I began to translate it as I read it, identifying the phrase Gayatri Spivak mentions, those impossible threads that dangle from the language textile, refusing to be ne neatly snipped or tied and yet our entry to the poem's complexity. The disappeared, to bear another, to be a pair, to be torn apart. The saying goes, evil was invented to give us something to talk about, but how to speak if each syllable falls into the sea, the M of mother drifting away, other, other, where have you gone? The F of a father sinking further down, other, other, where have you gone? They didn't fall, they were thrown to leave us without speech, to drown our words. Los desaparecidos, par han sido. Uy. The sea, el mar 
se inventó para tener de qué hablar. Pero cómo hablar si la sílaba es cana. La M de madre se va, madre, madre, ¿dónde estás? La P de padre se hunde un poco más allá, madre, madre, ¿dónde estás? Los lanzar de Adre, de Adre, Adre, de, los lanzaron de Adre, dejándonos sin hablar. Translation Spivak tells us is coming to terms with the fray. Will you tell me the story of how you shut off the light and sang and frightened your grandmother? I'm still trying not to be afraid of what I can't see. I want to develop a theory of how to translate the accent without killing the body. But like Langston Hughes, I have no translation theory. <laughs> um. I'm tempted not to read this part, but to just tell the story because it is a painful and funny story. But to stick to our design, I will do something that I very rarely do, which is actually read <laughs> on the page. Oh yeah. The sound of a lament arrived in me and came out as a cry that is not yet sung. It came when I was crying at the track exit of the Holland Tunnel in New York, where I live. I recognized it as an opening or command, as something that wanted to be, regardless of my fear or my shame, my inability to sing. To this sound, all that matters was being, and I had to respect that force. I had no idea where it would take me. And of course, the moment came when after being away from Chile for a long time, ignored by my fellow poets and friends, I received an odd invitation to perform at the only art gallery in Santiago that had managed to survive el apagón cultural, the shutting off the cultural spheres after the military coup. Galeria Carmen Po. Somehow, I knew I had to let out the cry on that event. By the way, the reason I'm doing this, these are these indicate quotes. Nathaniel Mackey, referring to Lorca's Duende, writes, you have to root your voice in fabulous origins, find your voice in the dark among the dead. And one of the things that marks the arrival of the wind in flamenco singing is a sound of trouble in the voice. The voice becomes troubled. Its eloquence becomes eloquence of another order, a broken, problematic, self-problematizing eloquence. So the wind is something beyond technical competence or even technical virtuosity. It is something troubling. It has to do with, with trouble, deep trouble. Deep song delves into troubled water, troubles the water. <clears throat> My mother and grandmother, who was close to 100 years old at the time, were present, along with some acquaintances and strangers. Ridicule is worse than death in Latin America, and there I was, semi ready to face ridicule because that cried would not have it otherwise. So I came up with the idea of hiding by asking the gallery to turn off the lights 
so the audience was in total darkness while I was in the next room with my drum. I began wailing and there was total silence. It's like I had broken a rule. And my grandma later told me, Mijita, don't ever do that again because it's very scary. This was the very first time I was doing it in public. This must have been in 1986 or perhaps 89. And a shudder went down my spine as if I had fallen in an abyss. I was in their hands, not knowing what that was, yet sensing its aliveness. I wonder why when I wrote these lines to you, I said I was in their hands. Whose hands can that be? The owners of sound say indigenous traditions. Can you imagine an owner of sound? What a soulful idea and what a crazy idea at the same time. Yet sensing its aliveness. I think singing in public is like being naked or forced to shit in front of others. Something really horrible. But there's something worse than horrible. Disobeying the inner command. So truly, there's no choice. Or the choice is not to hear the inner voice and live with the consequences. I suppose something in us designs and takes us. All I can say by way of advice to those who ask how this is done. There's no possible advice. All I can do is repeat the words I heard Bob Dylan say in a film. That his art died when he attempted to please others. Cecilia, this is an incredible story. The way you responded to El Apagón Cultural, the cultural blackout that followed the military coup by singing in the shadow of the coup, the dictatorship's terrorizing presence. El canto se da en la sombra, one could say in this case, what it offers to others in that shadow, how it emerges and thrives, but also how it terrifies because it refuses to look away from the cultural and political conditions from which it arises. Edouard Glissant would say, this is why we stay with poetry, poetry being also song. I too was raised with this sense that to hacer el ridículo was worse than death. To make a fool out of yourself was worse than death. So I have no doubt that this attitude of propriety in Chile is part of its colonial legacy. In my family's case, impacted by the Franco dictatorship, to act in a way that was not acceptable was to attract the attention of those ready to violently cut down dissent. Studying your, studying your work, I am often amazed by your absolute ethos of freedom and vulnerability, where you expose yourself to this ridicule, going against what others expect of poetry in order to transform a space often encoded in respectability and mastery. You once said to me, referring to the impact of the coup and your subsequent exile, the coup disintegrated language. The disintegration of my speech began when that ax blow was inflicted on us. If we are to be made into litter and cast off, then fine, I assume that position. I am garbage and cast off, and that is my language. This refusal to make things whole when things are not whole, to meet the world's precarity by enacting the precarious, to enter into the abyss. Few of us can face this fear, assume this risk, to find a new language not predicated on mastery. That's it. That was our exchange. <laughs> it was amazing. 
Thank, Thank you, you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I, I want to say um, before I forget, because I know we're going to get questions and get into a conversation, mm -hmm. um, but I want to thank um, you, Dawn and Angie for putting this together and uh, Stefan um, and Alexis is doing all the technical magic uh, behind the scenes. Uh, University of Pittsburgh uh, Center for African American Poetry and Poetics um, and the Contemporary Writer Series. Um, uh, it's just, this has been amazing. It's been a beautiful, beautiful experience um, to be able to create, create something for this space and for everyone who's in the audience. So thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, Cecilia, for doing this with me. <laughs> I'm thinking of this, Don. <laughs> <and Angie. laughs> well, I love that you all made something new. You know that you. This is a new work. This is a new uh, performance that you just create. You created based on our conversations. Um, and I, I actually, Angie and I were just texting. And I was just going back and forth. We we're going back and forth about who was going to ask what. But I think that I will ask this opening question, which will help folks understand what it is that you just did. And I'm just curious about how that came about. And if you could actually say a little bit about um, really like the, the, the text, because I understand that some of those um, textual images were found, um, I think by you, Rosa, in your personal archive and the way that they uh, relate and kind of helped bring this performance into being. Yeah, you know, I um, I started writing to Cecilia. Well, first we had a conversation um, about what we would do here today. And I said to Cecilia that we have never really talked about our translation. And in fact, despite the fact that we've, we've worked together for 25 years, that we don't perform together much. I mean, every once in a while, but, but because Cecilia is fluent in English and because her work has moved more she creates more multilingual work now that includes English and she's mm -hmm. been performing English for so long. She doesn't really need me anymore. Um, I'm kind of just, I, I refuse to let go as, as I do in most relationships. So um, I, uh, I don't perform with her that much. And, and we also haven't talked about our translation process that much. I've written about, about it. I've given some talks about it, but she and I haven't really talked. So, um, I, we started writing and I started thinking about the first time I read her work and how we became um, connected. Um, and I remembered that, I re that she gave me, uh, that somebody gave me her book and that inside was her, um, her address and I wrote to her. So I went looking for her first letter to me. Um, and it's amazing, I had, you know, tons of, folders with things that I had forgotten about. So a lot of what was sort of shown, which I kind of missed because I was looking at the text I was going to read, um, but what the audience saw, a lot of those are letters to me and they're so beautiful because, you know, Cecilia's sort of visual sense comes through in her writing too. So those were letters to me over, over time. Um, now we email each other. So there is kind of a stop in those letters. Um, there aren't a lot of letters after, um, I guess, email. Um, yeah. So, and then that poem that we read was something I found in the archives that um, I never translated, but it was clear that she had faxed it to me at some point, perhaps with the intention of having it translated um, and it never happened. So that was a lost poem. That was kind of an interesting, um, you know, uh, unexpected thing to happen in looking at the archives that that the a lot of the conversation was circling around the idea of disappearance and of things falling into the abyss. Um, mm -hmm. And then this poem called The Disappeared kind of emerges. Was that on fax paper? It was, yeah. <laughs> it was, a, and then you, that's how you know it's a fax because it's on that fax paper and no right. one faxes, faxes anymore. Right. Yeah. I want to say something about this question of disappearance and um, I also disagree with Rosa that she says I don't need her anymore. It ain't true because I continue to write mostly in English. I perform in any language practically, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it is also in unknown languages. But 
Yeah. In terms of writing, it's very difficult for me to write in English, so I do write mostly in Spanish. But um, uh, occasionally I do write in English, and I want to say that this focus of disappearance in my life and in my work is tremendous because most people who speak of the disappeared think of the prisoners that were disappeared forcefully by the military dictatorship. But uh, truly, uh, I began focusing and working with the issue of disappearance in the 60s, uh, in the mid 60s, way ahead of the military coup. So I think it was Lucy Lippert who said that, uh, that my work about disappearance predicted disappearance. Mm -hmm. And I think the concept of the precarious was predica predicated on the a completely different sense of disappearance that is embedded in, in, in the, the disappearance itself, which is that in the indigenous sense, the traditional sense of ancient life, was that disappearing was a necessary step in the regeneration of life, in the recreation and transformation of processes. So disappearing is part of the metamorphosis of life. But in our culture, we have created a form of disappearance that is a brutal violence against being and against our connectivity to time, history, the present, the past and the future. And also we are creating a form of extinction, of universal extinction, that of course will end up bringing our own extinction unless we wake up. So thinking of these thoughts, suddenly I think it was Rosa who came up with the idea to recover that performance that we had done together uh, in the year 2002. So we scrambled and finally, with the help of Charlie Morrow and Francesco Cincotta, we reassembled all the elements of that and we did it. But then I was thinking that it is extraordinary that even this piece that is devoted to the disappeared people, uh, that you see is very strange that the, Military coup in Chile that was sponsored by the Americans caused 3,000 people to disappear. And the attack on September 11 caused another 3,000 people to disappear here in New York. So that a strange asymmetrical symmetry always pounded in, in my mind, plus the coincidence of the date, 11th of September. So all these things are appearing in me. And suddenly this morning, I realized that there's one further detail, which is that nobody speaks of the empire anymore. So that's another disappeared concept. Nobody speaks of imperialism anymore. You know, in the 60s and in the 70s, we all spoke about imperialism universally all over the planet, of course, except in the US. But everybody else did. So what happened is like the concept of globalization, which is not a negative, replaced imperialism. So it's like under this idea, we're still under imperialism, but disguised by another name. And so this notion of living in a lie, in a huge lie, I think is what in this poem that Rosa discovered pretty miraculously that she decided to look into her archive. I'm sure you don't do that very often, Rosa. <laughs> Go back, you know. Uh, and so finds this poem, which is about the destruction of language and how if language is destroyed and now we have fake news, we have misinformation, and the main tool of oppression now in the world is lies and misinformation. Mm -hmm. So this work is it about disappearance or is it about the violence that takes the form of disappearing you know mm -hmm. um don did you want to follow up with a question i'm i do have a question that's related actually so you have me thinking about um when it comes to disappeared and languages or how language gets um, uh, kind of crushed by violence. And it actually brings me to a question about translation, um, which feels like in part to me that there's something that happens in between 
languages in the act of translation, that it's not like either or, right? That there is some kind of, I don't know how to describe it, but something that happens in that in-between space that seems to be meaningful. And it might not even just apply to languages, but I guess, you know, genres or forms and, you know, of artistic creation, that in-between space. Um, and I guess I have a question about excavation when it comes to that. If there's what's excavated or can be excavated in that in-between space, it makes me think about something that has to do with human connectivity too. So um, I'm just curious about if that speaks to you both in any way. Rosa? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the in-betweenness, um, you know, when, when Cecilia and I began working together, um, we would work in the same room and, and I would ask questions. And what I didn't anticipate in that relationship is how often um, the process of, you know, moving her poem into English or kind of trying to find a way to, to move it into English, that it would then um, impact the, the original Spanish and that she was always open to that. Um, and it surprised me in that moment because I think that I had always been taught about this kind of pristine quality of final versions. And in between this is not about a pristine quality, but it's about something that's always changing. Um, and I think that there's so much value placed in um, you know, mastery and this thing that is going to, um, that, you know, represents sort of, um, you know, an ultimate object, right? That's going to, that's going to teach us something. Um, and it gleams, it gleams with, with, you know, perfection. Um, and I think in the process of translation, um, you begin to, you sort of have to let go of that, at least in the beginning, kind of, be in that space where um, mastery isn't possible. But I think as I, as I started to work, um, you know, over the years with Cecilia and I, and I began to understand the relationship between that position of refusing mastery that allowed for our work together as, as poet and translator, when I saw that in her performances, then I began to, to understand that, um, there is no original poem. I mean, there there is only sort of snapshots of something, you know, at a particular time. And you see that in her performances where she may have a poem that's published, but then how does it kind of uh, change over time in the performances? How does she allow for that opening that can only happen in that space and in that moment, Right, and the translation is also a snapshot of that moment of that exchange, right, between two things. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, um, uh, Walter Mignolo. He's an Argentine um, philosopher, theorist, who talks about languaging. Right, this was a very sort of important concept for me to think about Cecilia's work, but that he says, you know, the the word languaging, you know, the, sort of that he created to 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 have us see that language isn't a set fact. It's not just a system of rules. It's something that exists in exchange between people, right? So that gerund of something that is constantly evolving and changing and moving between people, um, you know, with an accent attached to it, right? I mean, what is it when someone has an accent and they speak it or the way they move their hands, I'm very gestural, um, or just the kind of heat, body heat between people when they speak, the cadence, all of that is so impossible to capture in language because mm -hmm. language is limited in, in many ways. It's only the kind of process of, of using it that keeps kind of expanding it and expanding it and renovating it and, and using it. So once I understood that, I understood why there was so much freedom between us. And not only that, that as a translator, I needed 
to understand. Spivak talks about, you know, creating the staging of language. Like, how is language staged? I needed to, to see that her poems were doing something and that if I stuck too closely to just kind of performing the way she was performing it, that it would be dead on the page. Because language languages, you know, it doesn't just do this kind of set thing. And if you move it into another language, it's gonna do it in a different way. Um, so I think that's the in-betweenness. And I think Cecilia uses the term in-betweenness a lot in her own work, right, Cecilia? Um, you know, the not knowing and the, in, you know, in-betweenness are, are connected. While it's in-between, you really don't know where it's going to go or how it's going to end up. Um, and that, that space is the space that needs to be protected most of all. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a political dimension to this as well. Yeah. In the sense that that refusing mastery was a conscious choice that I took as a teenager, you see. Uh, because I'm a mestizo, and I was always, if you are a mestizo, you are uh, Indian looking in Latin America. It's very much like here. I mean, total racism and so forth. And also I'm small. And so the desired person would be blonde and blue eyed, even in Chile, you see. So because I understood since I suppose I was like born four by the time I already knew that, like I'm sure all children know that they are lesser and so forth. So I began to evolve this notion that the, it was the imperfection. It was the my rebellion against the sort of canon of everything as it ought to be. I was naturally a, a, a person that wanted to disrupt. It's, long before theorizing i was already that you know and in my games in my playings and so forth and so when i began uh, acknowledging that i was a writer i was like nine years old you know by the time i was beginning to write daily i was like 12. so by the time i met rosa of course uh, i had so much practice in this refusal refusal of mastery I actually, in, when I was a teenager in Santiago, I wrote a very long, uh, tremendous work that is unpublished to this day, and it's called El Diario Estupido. So my pride was my own stupidity, you know, my own, uh, as the, 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 the freedom that I could get from not trying to be anything, you know, but simply observing who the hell I was, you know, Mm. in this moment, which of course would change in the next moment and so forth. So all this writing, all this exploration of my own nakedness and my own not fitting was for what made possible for me when I encountered Rosa and she was a young girl. And she was, I mean, I feel like a grandma when I speak about Rosa. <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, I see this beauty in her, in her soul, her spirit, her laughter, her, her wildness, you know, that was sort of compressed. I felt that what I could do for her was free her the way I had learned to free myself and look the, at the result. Look. look it hasn't me. worked. I'm still so compressed. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to imagine you know, before, Cecilia. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I sort of, yeah, I, I was sort of wild in my twenties. I mean, she remembers me kind of stumbling in after going dancing or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I've, I always say to people, I will never be as free as Cecilia Vicuña. I mean, that's just not my nature. Um, but I was thinking about what you were saying, Cecilia, about this kind of play. I think that children always play with language. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of, you know, beaten out of them academically. I mean, constantly, I even catch myself, you know, correcting my daughter when she says things incorrectly. Um, but especially, I think if you grow up bilingual, that play, you know, with my, my cousins and I would constantly cross Spanish and English. Um, and there's a phrase in Spanish, um, ponerse los pantalones, like to put on your pants, make a decision. I mean, it's kind of, I guess it's, you know, probably gender based, right? Like if you're a man, you put on, you make a decision, you put on your trousers. 
Um, but pantalones always sounded like the archaic pantaloons to us growing up. So we would say, put on your pantaloons, <laughs> you know? So we would say this to tell someone to make a decision, but it comes from the Spanish phrase. And yet we brought in this archaic pantaloons and no one wears pantaloons anymore. Um, so that to me, you know, that was really um, kind of the, the nature of my experience with language, but then I go to school and the Spanish department is here and the English department here. And then, you know, there's this, always this kind of division created. Um, and even at the time when I started writing, like even including foreign languages was kind of not really a thing or it was kind of still, Spangl Spanglish wasn't really being theorized about as much or, or sort of, in, you know, really seen as something that people wanted to do in poetry. Um, I mean, there were certain, you know, writers who were doing um, that, but in the academic sense, I still didn't sense that freedom. And then of course it was wonderful meeting Cecilia because not just, you know, yes, she wrote in Spanish, but remember she was a writer in New York and the other two writers I've translated who I've all met through Cecilia were also writers who wrote in Spanish, but who were living in New York. And there's something specific about that, right? About someone who's writing in a language that is not the, you know, the, the, the language that's spoken in that country. They're, they're writing in a language that's, that is hard to publish in the country where they're living. So I sort of under, I understood that dynamic to some extent. And that was a, you know, uh, I didn't, it, I, you know, it's not like I set out to do that. But I realized that there was a kind of affinity um, with, you know, Cecilia and Lila Semborain and, and Lourdes Vasquez because they were Spanish speaking writers writing in the US that drew me to them, drew me, you know, they were thinking about these things in, in their work. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say something really quickly before we move into questions from the audience. But, um, what I, I'm still thinking about the use of imperialism and the more recently I heard um, someone talk about literary imperialism and what's happening mm -hmm. writing as like when we talk about mastery it's like mastery for who right and who are we trying to master something for um, and mm -hmm. I love the way Cecilia like when you say wild I think free free self right and free self is not trying to speak to anyone but the speaker that you actually can hear and see you, right? And when you talk about um, how the coup um, disintegrated language, and therefore you're like, I assume the position of garbage, like how empowering that position is um, to think, you know what, like, I will just take and start from this precarious place and you practice it through your unplanned performances and, um, and how liberating it is to watch you do it. Um, so, you know, in thinking about Rosa, like what does it mean to be wild? Like, you know, I think it's not about going out. Like for me, it's really like allowing yourself to listen to that inner command that you say that by disobeying it, you know, it's a violence to ourselves to not listen to the inner command. And I feel like as people of color and marginalized people, we're constantly being trained to not listen to our inner commands. So I wanna thank you. Um, I needed these words today. I'm very emotional today. You know, today, even in the chat, I, I have the chat going on the side and I saw someone correct the way <laughs> you pronounce your name, Vicunia, 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 it's not. And I said, oh, there it goes. Even that, even people feel like they have to correct. And what I love, Rosa, when listening to your, um, everything you're saying about the potential of the hearing and mishearing, the error space that actually gives breath to words. Mm. Even pronunciation was created by someone that was not us. And what can mm. happen when we mispronounce? What can happen when we mishear? What can happen when we miss say? Like, um, is really exciting. And I just feel like this is exactly the conversation I needed. And I hope that people mm. that need this conversation where we need to decentralize this idea of mastering or master in order to produce something, I think, that allows for the wild self. So very cool. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm like, ah, all the feels. Um, question, um, John, you wanna ask this question? Well, I was I just, just gonna, 
I was just going to say that, um, first of all, we, we have as much time as we want. You know what I mean? We could take as much time as we want. <laughs> um, but secondly, I want to say what you're saying, Angie, also brings me to this, like what other kind of language, only a kind of wild in between language of darkness can be created from the, the ones who were thrown away. Right, like what other, or does one adhere to the kind of regular logic of the way that language attempts to make it sense? And because that's the kind of language that like organizes us and binds us in the first place, right? That is so absolutely true, you know? Mm -hmm. And it is really, um, in a way, I want to tell a story. Um, that sounds self-serving because it is self-serving. <laughs> <laughs> it is the following. You know, accidentally I was invited to do an anthology of Latin American poetry for Oxford University Press. And um, this was a huge surprise to me because um, I will not tell the story of how this happened, but the fact is that I did the anthology. It took me 12 years to do it, but I did it. So it's an anthology that fell absolutely, there it is, thank you, Rosa, that fell absolutely into the cracks. It was completely rejected both by English-speaking departments, because of course they don't care about Latin American poetry, but especially completely rejected by Spanish-speaking department, so it felt exactly in the middle. And I want the reason why I'm bringing it back is because of something that you said, Angie, and also you, Don, are saying the same thing in a different way, which is that about the creativity of the one that is the wrong person. So, you know how I begin the anthology? I say that the most important creation of Latin America is the language, the way we speak the imposed language, the colonial languages that we have turned around. And who created those? It was the first women slaves that were raped and converted into the mothers of the next generation. In other words, they, I picked the, the symbol of the Malintzin, you know, the Malintzin, it was, she was a slave, uh, a Maya a slave that was sold by her own family into the Spaniards, and she became the mistress because she was so fucking intelligent that she became the lengua. That's how it was at the time. The Spaniards didn't have the word interpret or translate, or they just called her la lengua. So she was the language. I mean, I, I find that so incredibly beautiful. So I said, she is the creator of the poetics of language that we all speak. She has a symbol, all the mothers, all the mestizo mothers. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's anyone who has ever noticed that I said that? Of course not. Hmm. One that has paid any attention to the fact that it could be a woman, that it could be a slave who created this intonation that changes completely the structure, the syntax, and the meaning of the language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it just gave me the chills to show this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking about that question. That's what the, a question that Fred Moten often asked is like, you know, how is it that we, how it's like a rhetorical question, but how is it that we are able to create something? But I think he means also amazing things, innovative things, innovative art art objects from nothing, from a position of being like the most disparaged, the most bereft, and then out comes the most innovative, you know, jazz or the most innovative poetry or the most innovative, you know, language. Um, yeah. You know, um, I, we have to go to questions, but I just thought of, um, Rosa, you talked about um, in something I had read outside of this about language shame and that language shame is the foundation to your poetry, which is another thing too, right? Like when you're in a context, instead of like working with that space of discomfort and rupture um, as a space of making, you know, I think it's really cool. Um, questions, I guess. Don, do you, yes. Go where, ahead. do you have, a, do you want me to follow where? Okay, question from the audience. Um, okay, so this is a question um, for both of you. 
um, from the audience. It says, Ceci um, Rosa and Cecilia, do you have something to say about this? Um, does the fact that Cecilia is singing or also creating sculptures with thread or the precarios affect how you think about her language when you come to translate it? So this is for Rosa. Or does the language exist distinctly when you approach it? That makes sense. Did I make sense? Yeah. yeah. What was the first part, the the threads and before that? It does the fact that Cecilia is singing. Or oh, the singing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Affect how you yeah. think about the language when you yeah. translate it. It it didn't it didn't in the beginning when I first started translating her. I mean it uh, even though the first time before I started translating her, I saw her in her performance. I invited her to Brown University where I was doing my MFA, and I didn't know what to expect. And my only experience of poetry readings was person comes to podium or gets introduced, comes to podium, reads out of a book. And if you've been to a, a performance by Cecilia, um, you know that's there's, you know, you, you can't, you, you, whatever model or, or idea of a poetry reading is just not going to happen there. Um, and so even though I had seen that, and then even through our working together, we started working together in Edinburgh, Scotland in 96, that's when the book was published. I had seen her perform, but it was very compartmentalized. It was like, this is what's on the page. And then she does her performances. Um, so, you know, when I translate her, well, remember that I, I did Spit Temple, so, you know, Spit Temple book. That's when I started thinking about the performances as these other things. And I actually, um, you know, these are transcriptions of performances. Um, and I had uh, studied with Dennis Tedlock at Buffalo and he was sort of the, you know, um, one of the sort of creators of this concept called ethnopoetics. Um, and I tried to capture the singing. I tried to capture the aspect of performance. You know, everything in the transcription also included all the gestures. So all of it is there that, you know, but I did go into crisis mode when I did this, or I had this sort of crisis when I did this book, because part of my argument is that there is a difference between the poem on the page, which can be reproduced and the performance, Cecilia had never, as part of her project, wanted to, to record them, or she never, you know, uh, she didn't have recordings that she, you know, she wasn't producing, um, uh, you know, any, she wasn't writing about her performances, she wasn't putting them online, she wasn't distributing them. Um, the performances were something that very much existed in a time and place. So here I was arguing that this is sort of the, the crux, the center of her work, that this was, that her ethos can be found in the performances and these things that fall apart and the in-betweenness and the precariousness and the singing and the threads. And yet I was then putting it on the page and, um, you know, creating this book that in, in some ways was freezing these performances. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I sort of um, ask myself that and then sort of resolve it in the introduction. I won't go into that, but um, I had to understand that you can never, you know, um, you could never just reduce something to the page because there will always be a reader and that reader will undo the page as well. So I had to believe that those performances were cont would continue. So now when I translate Celia, I even noticed it in translating The Disappeared, is that, and some other things I've done just recently when we did, I know I'm just gonna keep holding books up. Um, when we did this, which was not too long ago, I translated new work. I did ask her questions, but I felt, um, um, I felt like I had much more agency to use this word that maybe is overused, but I, I felt like I had much more agency to make decisions um, because of that entire process of the 20 years of seeing her performances. It was like, I had the trust that inner voice that said, this, this is what needs to happen because there's so much of the, this language play that she does, it's impossible to just replicate that I needed to create a new performance of that poem in English or it wasn't going to work. So I think it's taken me 
time to understand, you know, all those things that the, the, the question implies is that the thread and the singing are these ways in which, um, you know, poetry is, you know, given new life in a space, right? And that our, rela our relationships to each other become the poetry as well. And so all of that has come, you know, has entered my poetics of translation, which is like, how do you recreate all of those relationships, you know, that are both on the page and outside the page in the English, knowing that the reader is then going to undo those threads, they're going to mm -hmm. sing it for themselves, there's going to be these other versions. Mm -hmm. So I hope I answered your question. I know I kind of went, sort of digressed a little bit, but I think that's the topic of our Mm. of our event. Yeah, I can add to what Rosa has said, which is beautiful, that uh, the reason why, there's so many reasons, and I would like someday for us to go over what were the reasons that these performances of mine were never recorded or never, uh, you know, uh, sort of set apart. You also know this, I remember, that for many years I did my precarious works without taking photos of them. And so a, a huge amount of my work has been completely and absolutely and irretrievably lost. And But I remember long ago somebody asked me, I think it was, I was doing a talk at MoMA and one of the curators asked me, but, but how is it that people think that you're working for memory when <laughs> Of your work sort of, or a huge portion of your work disappears. And I think it was in that moment that I understood the difference between a, an indigenous concept of memory and the literary academic concept of memory as being written. And this is a factor that still hasn't gotten enough attention on the part of the field of so-called knowledge that rules the world which is that there are so many kinds of memory and that in my acting in that way was not that I was devaluing the performance or devaluing the significance of the precario, but the actual opposite, which is that I always believed that there were other forms of memory. For example, uh, I remember when I was doing the, the first precarious in the beach, that would be eaten away by the high tide to disappear. I mm -hmm. imagine in my mind the following. I imagine someone that sees this passerby who happens to be walking by and sees that this is disappearing. Hmm? There's, not, there's nothing to it. But what if there was a person that thinks, hmm, interesting, and this story is told, and this story is heard, and transmitted, creating a new wave of a storytelling out of having seen something completely absurd, stupid, ridiculous as what I was doing. You know? mm -hmm. And that gave me such joy and comfort to understand that there is not only the memory of the land itself, which history now has proven, now there's a whole new field of knowledge and studying how memory is in actually the land, like indigenous people have been saying all along, but also this other form of fluid bringing back the concept of liquid stars that was so beautiful, Don, mm -hmm. that you captured that line. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I mean, it's so beautiful that this liquid quality of memory is in us because we are water people too, you know. Mm. Um, as you know, uh, for example, water is the conductor. So the conductivity of memory is something that we need to pay attention to. And it involves as well understanding that we are being felt by the land, by the air, by the plants, mm. by other people. So this self-centeredness of our uh, culture that has to do again with ruling and controlling and mastering. The counterpart of that is sensing the way we're being sensed. 
something mm. so uh, sort of primary is who we are losing. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I wonder if I could just say, because I think this is important, this idea of lostness. You know, we talked about the poem being lost in the archives, and then often we talk about what's lost in translation. And I think lostness is um, something that's very central. I mean, I don't think of what's lost in this sense as being negative. And in Cecilia's performances, that lostness, the the thing that can't be heard, for example, um, the thing that gets, um, you know, because of a failed mic or because someone doesn't understand Spanish or someone doesn't understand English in the audience, that kind of lostness, um, you know, uh, what gaps does it create, but what can, what, what possibility is there in the gaps? Like what happens, what can grow in those gaps of what can't be, you know, understood or what's missed um, and sort of the lostness of the performances, the lostness of, of, of the precarios. And so when we were putting together Spit Temple, a lot of it was around like, not just what we could recover, but how can we speak into what we couldn't recover? Um, and there were various things that we did in the book to, to address that or to acknowledge that the gap was there without trying to fill it. There were some performances, there was one performance in particular, I think it was at, at um, maybe Art in General, if you mm -hmm. remember that, Cecilia. Um, I was intent, you couldn't, hear the, you couldn't hear the performance and Cecilia said, oh, Jenna Osman was there. And so I reached out to Jenna Osman and I sent her the performance, which you couldn't hear as well. I mean, it was just this kind of like terrible videotape and there was, um, there was like creaky stairs. It was like half of it you just couldn't hear. Um, and I decided I was gonna transcribe it anyway because I didn't wanna rely just on very good recordings. There was something wrong about, about having attended her performances and knowing that often you can't hear, right? That often you're, you're somewhere like in the back and you can't see, or that sometimes you don't catch something or you're distracted. Um, all of those things are part of the performance. So I wanted to include those audio tapes or videotapes that reflected how things are lost when they're communicated and transmitted. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, trans we transcribed or I transcribed the art in general performance and, and Jenna Osman wrote an accompanying piece to, to talk about her memory. And of course her memory includes what's lost as well, right? What's recovered, but also what isn't recovered. Um, and yeah, I think I think the 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 potential of of that, you know, and that historically, right? That there's there's also, um, I mean, I can't, you know, as I was translating the disappeared, and I'm going to teach Zong next week, so I was thinking about like how much that poem speaks to Zong, um, you know, these syllables falling into the sea. But I was also thinking about, you know, those who were killed. Um, in Georgia, those who were just killed in, in uh, Boulder, um, all of these, you know, what do we do with the loss, right? What do we do at this moment with that loss? How do we acknowledge it and not simply say, you know, as I saw in the New York Times headline, like call for new gun laws. I mean, I've seen that a thousand times, call for new gun laws, call for new gun laws. So there's a way in which that lostness is not being acknowledged and taken as an opportunity, what do we do with the lostness now, right? Mm. What what comes of this? Mm. I am, um, can I, I just wanna go back to what Cecilia was saying around um, witnessing an event that is precarious, but if one person witnesses it and they're able to retell the story, how it keeps it alive, and I've been thinking it's connected a little bit to some of the conversations that you've had in the past around official record and what goes in the official record versus what goes in the stories that we witness that are outside of the official record. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, just it's very um, exciting to think that if, if one person could experience the story or see the art, even if precarious, that it's enough, right? Which again, 
this we have this moment of over documentation everything's recorded every zoom is recorded every photo is recorded every moment is recorded and it's almost like if it's not documented or recorded it didn't happen um when in reality like our experience of something and our ability to retell it in whatever way we want to retell it is official record as well you know and again mm -hmm. centralizing the master narrative or the dominant narrative um so i just yeah it's more of a comment really <laughs> I, I wanted I wanted in the official record that this is the first time I've seen Cecilia read off of a piece of paper for a reading and I made her do it. <laughs> I was gonna ask about that. I was thinking about I was like gonna ask if Cecilia you were uncomfortable with the um with the the opposite of improvisation. <laughs> of course. Of yes. course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. I thought it was preposterous that one should be reading because you know part of this i mean this relates to what angie was saying too that you see currently because we cannot have conversations and conversation is really going extinct because everybody is either busy or afraid and now with covid of course so once conversation goes away storytelling will go away i mean it's just so incredible so the counterpart of that to keep the lie to keep the illusion is the documentation the super documentation mm -hmm. what's going to happen with all the technology that is documenting these things is going to be blown away in, in no time in just three four years all this technology will probably not even be usable anymore mm -hmm. so is this this whole horrendous paradox in which we are. And I believe that as Rosa is saying, it is in this paradox, in this uh, fact that we're losing everything, that mm. it's really our only possibility, our only potential. And in ways that we clearly don't know, don't understand, but I think that's a positive, you see. And that is, is part of the rebellion because people like us, like the four of us, we were nurtured, we were born from and because of this uh, inability to, to, to fit, you know, to, to be what we, it is, is what is the, the ruling orders of this world that are actually destroying the world. Mm -hmm want for people to be so it's like we shouldn't be even here you know and so is is this but we are and we're breathing and, and we're together and and what is it that will become of all of this hmm. yeah. um Thank you for that. I think that I'm, I'm getting some notes from the back room that um, our time is up. I think that's a perfect place to end. Actually, Angie. Yes? It's on you. Did you read your order of show? <laughs> so caught up in the conversation. No, I'm going to uh, the improv this is the improvisation there's an order of show <laughs> okay thank you everyone um we have another event coming up oh my god don what is the date i'm sorry i don't remember the date we have an event april 4th or april 3rd april 14th we have an event 14th. um Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so I'm still thinking about what Cecilia said. I was, I'm in the moment. I'm being. In it's okay. <laughs> we'll post it in the chat um, so that everyone can see when our next event is. It's April 14th at 6 p.m. We'll put the participants. I just want to thank you. I, I mean, I feel so energized by this conversation. I feel like we didn't get to even a third of the questions that we had for you. I, I could talk to you all night, but. I know that you know you have evenings to get to. So um, thank you for a beautiful event and for being in conversation with us in this particular moment um, about you know all of the things we talked about. But I think in the I was particularly interested in like the ways in which um, the past continues to resonate in this moment. And I think that the two of you give us um, really interesting ways to think about um, our vibrations with each other our vibrations with the earth um, and that way that you talk about 
at memory, Cecilia. So um, thank you. And good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Ciao, ciao.